Thank, thanks, for, thanks for that. Um, well, I, I, I want to follow on from what Walt's just said and um, flip through uh, some specific examples from, from one institution uh, around how we've tailored products and then maybe build on uh, a little bit of what, of what Walt's uh, been talking about. So um, in, terms, in terms of um, a University of Wollongong, um, uh, a, a young institution by, by global standards, um, established to uh, service the requirements of uh, steel manufacturing and the mining sector in a particular region of, of Australia and then has developed over the last 50 years uh, and now has a, a presence uh, in the Gulf as well and a whole range of exec ed courses uh, across uh, management, uh, HRM, logistics, finance, international business, computing science, a whole range of things. Um, I think the other, other point is uh, because of the sort of evaluation framework we now uh, sit in, um, most universities aspire to be in the leading group, uh, Wollongong uh, with, within the top 2% uh, in the world and amongst the very best uh, young universities in the world. But going back to uh, the Adam Gilchrist uh, session from uh, uh, the large group we were in before the morning break, I think, interestingly, um, this is a university that's also done it to itself, which is a point that Adam, Adam made. So I think we were the first university in Australia to require compulsory training for all academic staff uh, in how to, how to deal with uh, tertiary uh, training and education and engagement of various sorts. So it's, it's that sort of self-reflection that you, that you see in institutions. I think we've also uh, spent a lot of time thinking about the niches that uh, we're strong in and where we can be uh, complementary in working with industry uh, and, and government and how to build those partnerships. So one example uh, here, uh, along with the Singapore Institute of Management, uh, since 2005, we've developed uh, the largest uh, information security uh, program uh, for servicing professional requirements around ITC uh, for industry and government uh, in, in that part of the world. Um, simultaneously, we've uh, invested very heavily in new infrastructure, predominantly for research, and of course this is a role that most universities around the world have had, but we've asked the question, how do we capitalise on that and leverage the major research centre? So this is a, an example, um, a new uh, facility that opened last year, $65 million facility on campus dealing with integrated infrastructure research and training and off the back of that we're asking the question how do we how do we leverage that in order to provide new classes of products that don't exist so uh, one example we're working with uh, with Brookings uh, Institute uh, in Washington to develop a series of master classes covering new perspectives in transport and economics and project evaluation. So trying to tease out what we know is a major global issue uh, really uh, for uh, a sector which has been long neglected. I think if you look at the way that infrastructure investments have been held uh, compared to how we've dealt with service industries or staffing, this is a set of niches which uh, we think are highly, highly prospective. I think here in India, and the point that, again, that, uh, that Adam Gilchrist made in the previous session, we've been coming on a regular basis. Uh, I go to uh, Delhi uh, this evening uh, to meet with colleagues at CSIR, which is, for those of you who are not from India, uh, India's largest uh, uh, federal uh, science organization, and again, trying to tease out partnerships that will deliver new categories of products uh, and to link our research capabilities across global boundaries along with new classes of, of training uh, products. Similarly, we've worked with uh, emphasis to bring those, uh, those individuals, that company, into, into our innovation centre to allow Indian expertise to be present in Australia to build a special uh, resource pool for our telecoms industry and add value to that. I suspect universities 10 years ago, 15 years ago, just did not have that type of role in society. So we're now seeing a new category uh, of activity uh, developing. Um, so um, we've leveraged our, uh, our capabilities in that in order to uh, use the skill base that we've got to add value to that particular uh, company. We've also tried to connect uh, to the world, so a, a very big 
large company strategy for executive training. Uh, an example here with uh, Hong Kong uh, Mass Transit Rail Authority providing training specifically tailored to, uh, to their senior, senior managers. Uh, we've worked uh, over the years uh, with uh, Nortel, Accenture, Andrew Corporation doing similar things, and most recently with Bao Steel uh, from China to, uh, to move uh, their skill set around uh, supply chain management solutions with a, with a tailor-made MBA program that, that deals with that. So a big, large company uh, strategy uh, connecting uh, the university uh, to the world. Another example, uh, BP uh, wanting a tailored program around occupational health and hygiene practice, and so this is for staff in Chile. So you've got you know, a global company in one location in South America and an Australian university. It sort of plays back to the point that Walt made that the mix of how uh, entities are going to interact in the future is, is going to have to be pluralistic to drive that skill set. So for industry to succeed, we know that, that vision, leadership, uh, and business acumen are important. We know that products and services are important. And we know, and we've just heard from Walt, that skilled and motivated human resources are, are significant. So what's, what's the role uh, of uh, universities uh, in driving executive education in that? Well, we think that operational relevance is, is important, plus the experience uh, of our staff uh, working with, uh, with companies in co-production, and then rigorous t t teaching uh, methods. at the University of Wollongong and a number of other uh, major business schools have around the world, is that we don't see this as a one-off training activity. What we're trying to do is to, to create a relationship between the university academics and the providers of the course and the people who were on a particular cohort to keep on reinforcing, keep on reinforcing that relationship. So the, the, the bad news for, for students who go on to our programs is we don't let them go. There's continual follow-up uh, of support uh, for those participation participants to make sure they're trying to put into action some of the things that, that, that they've learned. Um, we, we drive a lot of that through our Sydney Business School uh, facility, which is uh, based uh, beside the Opera House in Sydney. And there we've uh, had a strong focus on leadership uh, uh, and entrepreneurship. Uh, de very deliberately, and I hope it's come through in the examples I've given you, tried to, to drive that with a focus on Asia and uh, multicultural uh, activities so that we've developed pluralistic approaches rather than country-centric approaches to, uh, to, our, to our training and a whole range of disciplines included. And I think there's a leaflet on your desk uh, launching a series of programs here in, in India uh, today, uh, which is the, the, the blue uh, leaflet uh, that's there. A couple of quick uh, examples. So case studies. Here's uh, Endeavour Energy Power Quality and Reliability Centre working uh, with the university on a continuing education program now over, over two decades and a whole range of technical uh, issues embedded in uh, a, a course for senior managers about how to drive this set of processes within their company structure. So trying to make sure that our engineering capabilities and our management school capabilities come together where we can produce tailored, tailored project products. Um, second example, I made reference to it before, uh, Mass Transit um, Hong Kong, uh, looking at uh, asset investment and management training and trying to develop uh, professional multidisciplinary skill sets and looking at risk issues uh, in particular uh, and with some specific uh, processes here around reducing uh, costs uh, uh, on, on the training that we put in place. Um, you, as many of you will have been to the previous session where, where Adam Gilchrist, the Australian cricketer, spoke, and I, I was intrigued to see this, uh, this picture uh, in, um, in the Australian Financial Review about a month ago. Um, this is a, a, a graph showing uh, career average at test cricket, and the, the, the uh, x-axis on that is the, the degree of riskiness that, uh, that, um, that those individuals Took. And so you can see uh, Sir Donald Bradman in the top corner with the iconic uh, average of 
0.94. His, in his career, I think he only hit six, six sixes uh, over the whole of his test career. Adam Gilchrist, who's in the other corner, is the only test cricketer to have ever hit 100 sixes in, in test cricket. The point of this slide for me is that if you look at the, the seven names coming back from Gilchrist through to uh, Tendulkar, Pollock, uh, Justin Langer, nearly all of those people are contemporary, contemporary cricketers. The ones who are further to, uh, to, uh, to the zero mark are cricketers who go back uh, way back into the history of the game. What's happened here is that what we've done as consumers is that we've, de we've demanded a different type of behaviour from these professional sportsmen. And I think our staff are being pressed continually by our customers to behave in different ways, to, 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 tailor, to tailor what they do. And I think part of the role of executive education is to make sure that our staff are able to respond to the customer sets and the demands that are being made. This is, I think, an example of you know, monetization in a particular sport has driven us to expect high performance and high risk and all the sorts of things that we saw in the video that Adam uh, played right at the very start. So, executive education, the cost of not doing it, well, uh, I, think, I think Walt summarized that pretty well. I think what, what I hope you get from uh, this presentation is that the very best universities around the world now in the exec ed space are thinking this is an act of co-production with the customers that we're working with. That we're seeing it as a partnership, partnership and an enduring relationship. Some of the examples I've shown you go back uh, 20 years. We're trying to tailor specific products rather than just giving you generic off-the-shelf uh, products. We hope our products as, as institutions are dynamic and refresh continually as part of the dialogue between, between universities and the people commissioning uh, the work. And I think the very best universities are actually leaning on the students who go on the class to say this is not a one-off experience, but we expect follow through uh, and engagement if companies are making the investment in you as individuals. Thank you very much.